A Celtic state of mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for a Celtic state of mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support. Welcome to a Celtic State of Mind, I'm Paul John Dykes, and today I'm delighted to be joined by Colin Watt. Welcome back to a Celtic State of Mind, Colin. Thanks for having us back, Paul. It's always a pleasure, and this episode is a new feature podcast, Colin, where we select an image from Celtic's illustrious past, and we talk about that moment in time. Tell me about this week's moment in time. What is it? So this week's moment in time, you don't really have to go too far back. We're actually talking just about the season that we've just had completed um, and probably the moment of the season. The image that we are looking at here is just after Olivier and Cham lobs the ball over the goalkeeper and it's the iconic celebration of the handstand in front of the Celtic fans, the 8,500 travelling Celtic fans in uh, Rome. That iconic image which will go down is one of Celtic's most iconic images throughout history. First time a Scottish team's won in Italy. First time uh, Celtic's won in Italy. And oh, a sore head for me the next morning, put it that way. Well, a sore head for you, Colin. It may have been a sore head had you not been at the game, but you were one of the lucky 8,500 who travelled over to Rome. So first and foremost, let's talk about your recollection of that moment in time, because I think it felt like more than a moment to you when you were in the stadium. Oh, honestly, it felt like a lifetime. I remember just before the goal was scored, we had the ball in the right-hand corner, left-hand corner if you're watching it on TV, and we had the throw-in, and it looked as if we were just trying to kill time, just trying to see the game out. And I was happy with that. I was more than delighted for Celtic to be going back with a point. And the guy standing next to me, he's he wasn't having it. He was determined we could still win this game. And I'm, I'm kind of looking at him going, have you seen our away European record? A, a point against Lazio is incredible. What's this all about? And he's like, no, no, no. We can win this. We can win this. And I'm going, nah, no chance. But right enough, the ball falls through. Edward picks it up, plays it into and Cham. And as the ball is lofted over the goalkeeper, we're just kind of standing there. And I'm, I'm turning to my pals and we're going, is this really happening? Like the, the ball seemed to take forever and a day to drop down. At first, I thought he'd missed it. And it's two second delay. And you go, has this really happened? The ball's actually dropped into the net. We are now 2 1 in front. And from that moment onwards, we just leapt in the air. I actually didn't see in Cham's celebration because I'm too busy hugging my friends, hugging that random person that told me that we could get the three points. I didn't see it until we watched the the goals back the next day. And that moment will live with me as one of the best moments I've ever had following Celtic, home, away, anywhere. Just the the scenes that day and the, the, the hour and a half that we spent in the stadium after it, singing and and dancing, it was incredible. It was Just one of those moments where I was absolutely delighted to be part of it and I'm sure there's thousands of people that are absolutely gutted that they weren't there. You're talking about one of the best moments that you have had supporting Celtic and you obviously went over to Rome in the aftermath of the political fallout from the first leg, Colin. Celtic fans, largely by their very nature, have 
political sensibilities and they are on the left side of politics which is something that on a personal level I'm very very comfortable with and I feel shoulder to shoulder I feel very comfortable standing amongst people with the same views politically as I but I think the political nature of the statement made by Celtic fans during the first leg with the banner obviously of Mussolini hanging upside down and then you look at the images of Encham almost mimicking that although we know that was complete coincidence because this was Encham's celebration I think would you describe it as a front flip that he does when he scores goals it seemed just like a fall to the ground but it was beautiful <laughs> in style I've got an image of him he's in mid-air he's in mid-jump just about to land back on his feet so after the, the handstand, as you described, obviously flips over and lands back on his feet. So the lead up to this game, Colin, there was a lot of tension as a result of the political stand that Celtic fans took that night, and quite rightly so. When you went to Italy, obviously, you know, Rome is notorious for travelling fans getting stabbed, for example. Did you see any trouble? Was there any bother that you observed yourself? Do you know, it, it was really interesting. So we, if we take it back to the, the home leg, I remember what walking up we park quite down near towards Dalmarnock station um, and we walked up and we got about just before the velodrome and the amount of police that we saw that day was incredible I think every single person within the Glasgow constabulary was there it was unreal I've never seen that amount of police I'm, I'm talking Celtic Rangers games I'm talking high profile games against teams from down south There's never been as much police as what was there for that game. And I think it was quite obvious from the night before where Lazio fans were storming through uh, Glasgow City Centre with their marches and their protests and their just idiotic, basically racist behaviour on the day before the game that there was something was going to happen at that game. And as soon as the banner was unfurled at Celtic Park, that was it. That was the, the talk for the press, for everyone to start blaming Celtic fans if there was going to be any sort of trouble. And I'm not saying that I don't agree with what the banner says. As you said, we stand on the left wing of things and it was spot on. But unfortunately, it seemed to rail the sort of extremist fans within the Lazio fan base, which was always bound to happen. So when we we were travelling out to to Lazio, out to to Rome, it was an all-day travel. We left early in the morning. I flew from Aberdeen and we'd a stopover in Paris. And when we landed in Paris and we checked our phones, we could see that there was already trouble kicking off. Some of the Lazio fans had um, attacked Celtic pubs. We know ourselves from speaking to to Kevin Maguire, who was also over there, that he was in the pub that was attacked by the Lazio fans. And if it wasn't for the Italians that were there um, actually protecting the Celtic fans, there could have been a, a lot more trouble. But when we got into Rome, it was quite late on the night before the game. So I think a lot of the trouble had sort of subsided. But you were still quite nervous about being there, being in your colours. Um, as you said, Rome's notorious for especially English fans travelling over there and getting stabbed and getting seriously injured. So you were sort of erring on the side of caution, but there was still that buzz about going away and supporting Celtic for an away day. What you've got there, Colin, is you've got Celtic fans and in particular the Green Brigade who were displaying anti-fascist banners. And what Lazio were doing, you know, the Lazio fans, they were leading fascist marches through Glasgow. So it's one of these things whereby these types of situations were dealt with by punishing both sets of fans when in actual fact Celtic fans were displaying anti-fascist banners such as the mentality of the authorities that Celtic were also fined as a result of that but the tension from that first leg obviously led up to the second leg and I think anybody that's listened to a Celtic state of mind has heard my first leg story uh, so I won't bore you with that but I celebrated it with Andrew Innes at the primal scream And then obviously leading up to the game, you're in contact with global country superstar Kevin Maguire, who's a friend of a Celtic state of mind as well. Just I'm in a name dropping kind of mood tonight, Colin. So you knew or you had been given the heads up as to what was going on in Rome. And it's frightening when you're watching these videos and Celtic fans are kind of barricaded into pubs and, you know, the madness ensuing outside the barriers. And really, when you look at it, you know, Celtic fans were being criticised. And I noticed a hell of a lot on social media leading up to this. How can you criticise? a fan base for standing up to fascism and Alessandra Mussolini the granddaughter of the bold Mussolini who appeared on the flag as well so you had this whole backdrop leading up to the game 
and we've gone into that game against Lazio and uh, the star man if you like for them certainly the most prolific goal scorer that they've got is uh, Immobile and of course he opens a scoring and you're thinking the worst simply because you know Celtic Park gives you and this is something of note for the coming season it gives the players an extra edge I was talking to a musician about this and I know it's different but he was talking about feeding off the energy feeding off the positive energy of those in the crowd, you know, the fan base. And I think Celtic Park, the makeup of the stadium, the mentality of the fan base, the rich traditions and heritage of the club all feeds into this energy, which, you know, it makes Celtic Park a cauldron. And people talk about that from all over Europe, Colin, coming at Celtic Park. I honestly believe that under the correct set of circumstances, Celtic can beat anybody at home. I've seen Celtic play an absolutely murder at home. But there is those moments in time, you know, like the Barcelona game, which was eight years to the day before this particular game, you're going to be talking about at home, we can beat the best club outside in the world. So you're thinking to yourself when Immobile scores, after seven minutes ah, you know maybe the home advantage was the reason we got that result but Celtic the character shown during the 95 minutes not just the 90 minutes of Neil Lennon's side that night as you say you're saying it's one of the best experiences of your Celtic support in life talk to us about the comeback you know Forrest equalises after 38 minutes and we go in 1-1 at half time when you're looking back at that game for example we've mentioned previously Colin the performance of the likes of El Yunusi as well as the goals what was memorable from that performance over in Rome I'll be totally honest my track record going away in Europe with Celtic has been, to use the probably nicest word, absolutely honking. I hadn't seen Celtic score away from home in Europe. I was pretty much a jinx. So going over to this game, I think a lot of my pals are going, I tell you what, if we get horse this time, you're not coming back. So <laughs> the fact that Celtic actually pulled a goal back and I got to see Celtic score was amazing. Um, that was my main aim for the whole trip, was just to see a Celtic goal. Mm-hmm. But looking back at the game, um, and I've seen it back a couple of times now, we started very poorly. And I think a lot of that had to do with Johnny Hayes playing at left back. I think Johnny Hayes, as we discussed on the last podcast, he's a very committed player and he gives his all for the jersey. But he was caught out three or four times, including for the goal, he's caught out. And they seem to exploit that for the first 10, 15 minutes. But after that, Celtic grew. And they grew more and more into the game. And when the, the equaliser came, it wasn't against the run of play. Celtic were playing really, really well up until that point. And as I mentioned on the last podcast as well, Mohamed El was absolutely outstanding. He was showing the reason why Southampton paid all that money for him. Mm-hmm. Um, he was very attack-minded. He was linking up well with Edward. He was finding Forrest out in the wing. Um, and we talk about in Cham School, Forrest School is an absolute peach. He takes that so well from the position that he's in to actually score from that angle. It's absolutely incredible. And the goalkeeper's getting nowhere near it. It didn't matter who the goalkeeper was, that was going in. And it's probably one of Forrest's best European performances as well. Because we talk about Forrest and what he does in the league, and he certainly creates a lot, but... In Europe at times he's been found wanting, but not that night. He was he was outstanding that night. You know, when you look back at the game, you're absolutely right about Johnny Hayes. Sometimes these things can be forgotten about because of the, the nature of that particular result and the fact that it's become quite an iconic win for Celtic. You know, you've got that celebration ending up on T-shirts and pin badges and all sorts of different places. You know, it's become a staple part of the merchandise, isn't it? The Encham celebration. What I love about the celebration after the game, I suppose this comes back to the kit that we're wearing there. You know, we're looking at that yellow and green away kit and it started to bring back memories of the Seville run when we were winning game after game wearing that jersey. It's what made the the jersey famous, really. But there's a brilliant image, actually. After the game, and you've got Brown, Eduard, Encham and, and McGregor all celebrating and they're almost coming up to the camera that takes a picture to celebrate. And it's so reminiscent of another image after the, the Boa Vista game away from home and it's Balde, Larson, Lennon and you think that there's so many similarities sometimes that you think this year is our year. After the victory Colin and the celebrations, did you feel at that point that we were going to really do something in Europe and I know when we look back on it now it's pre-season, we're looking forward to the new season you can look back fondly at that European run because Celtic, Neil Lennon for me uh, made huge progress for Celtic in Europe this season. Were you ultimately disappointed uh, once we were knocked out by Copenhagen, particularly 
yeah. when you look at how we maybe played against them, you know, for the first hour of the first game. Yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting because I mean we're sitting that morning of the game, we we're all having brunch because we slept in, um, and I just threw the comment out there. I says, you know, we win this game tonight, we're we're through, and the boys are going, no, shut up, shut up, that's that's not going to happen. Behave yourself. But when the full time whistle went, and we realised we're actually through, the next thought wasn't on the other two games that were still to come because we still had two more games to play it was who can we get in the next round and when the draw was made and we got Copenhagen you're going that's not the worst draw at all the thought was right, who are we getting in the next round um, and as you say it's absolutely disappointing to get knocked out at that stage I think I don't know what it is it, it reminded me very much of when we played Cluj in the home game at Celtic Park we sort of ran out of ideas of how to, to chase and to get that goal that we needed and in the end up we sort of done ourselves out of it and that's exactly what happened against Copenhagen. We kind of ran out of ideas on how to, to get that goal and I think when you look back at it, when we look back at the games that we played in the group stage, there was never any panic. Even on the opening day against Rennes when you went one behind, there was never a panic. We fought and we fought our way back into the game. We, we took control of a lot of the group stage games. Even going back to that game in Rome, for the first 60-65 minutes of that game, Celtic were in control. It wasn't until maybe later on when the legs got tired that Lazio started to come back into it and they had their best chances of the game but Celtic never gave up but it just felt as though we kind of gave up in that game against Copenhagen and we were just resigned to the fact that we're the last 32 team and that's as good as it's going to get and I don't know if that's just the, the mentality of the squad because there's a lack of experience on those sort of occasions or it was just an off night um, but I was very disappointed, I'd have to say, that we didn't go beyond the last 32 because we've certainly got a squad there that could have made the last 16, the last eight quite easily. Um, Especially when you look at the fact that Rangers managed to get through and, OK, it looks as if they're going to get put out off Leverkusen, but there were still some teams in that last 16 that I certainly think we could have beaten. Well, it is an interesting view because the disappointment of that Copenhagen game was palpable, but I'm of the, the belief... Colin, that we've got a manager in Neil Lennon who very much believes himself that Celtic are a bigger side than a last 16 Europa League team. And I think that belief comes from, it's passed down from the manager that um, he cites as being the biggest inspiration in his football career, one of the biggest inspirations of his life in Martin O'Neill. And although O'Neill never won a European trophy as a manager, he knew how to do it as a player, as part of Brian Clough's great Nottingham Forest side. So when that is passed down from generation to generation if you like from Clough to Robertson and O'Neill and then on to Lennon I think Lennon has a completely different view on what Celtic can do in Europe and it's something I have mentioned a few times over the last wee while on a Celtic state of mind looking forward to the new season the priority is 10 in a row and I think most Celtic fans will realise that that is the be all and end all really going into this season Colin but we always look at Europe because you know it's a long hard road to get there uh, for a start it's then you know it's almost it feels as though you're qualifying twice for it going through the qualification process that you know 12th man as you could call it of the Celtic support isn't going to be there for the earlier rounds Celtic won't have the same buying power as you might have expected this pre-season, simply because of the circumstances and they're hedging their bets, as most of global football will be. Therefore, I'm looking ahead to next season and I'm wondering, because every club's going to be in the same boat, Colin, which is a great leveller, but I am wondering next season, can Neil Lennon build on the progress that was made? Obviously, there was a few concerns, mainly in the um, the games against Cluj where we were knocked out in the Champions League, but also the Copenhagen tie as well, which I think, you know, the, the most frustrating thing about that was Celtic were not at their best. Do you think we can progress further moving into this season, or do you think the 10 in a row, the lack of having fans at the game, probably not going to strengthen in a big way until January once we see how things develop globally is going to make European football this season a bit of a sideshow do you know it's it's very interesting personally I don't think there'll be qualifiers for the European competitions this year I just don't see how it's possible unless there's some sort of air bridges between European countries I can't see how teams can travel to do qualifiers for this year. I'm not sure exactly how UEFA are going to do this and how they're going to set up the Champions League and the Europa League. My hunch is that this new championship, European Championship or European Conference, whatever it's been called, I think that might get pulled forward a year and a lot of the teams that would have to qualify for the Champions League will move down into the Europa League and vice versa for the Europa League into this conference just to get some sort of normality as such to get the the European football back up and running again. But that would 
kind of give Europe more time to sort out uh, what's going on with the current coronavirus situation. But I, I can't see there being qualifiers. I think Celtic will either directly qualify for the Champions League on an enhanced stage where there's more than 32 teams in the group stage, um, or they'll directly qualify for the Europa League with some sort of compensation from UEFA for the fact that they didn't get the chance to qualify. And no matter which competition Celtic are in, I still think that there will be a drive from the team to get better and to do better than the previous year because when you look at the likes of Odson Edward, he's looking for his next club. We, we're hoping to keep him on for 10 in a row, mm. but the better he performs in Europe, the more it opens up his window of opportunity and it opens up to him getting a bigger and better team. Um, and there's probably a couple of players that are in that scenario where I think if we win 10 in a row, we could be saying goodbye to a couple of them. And this is maybe their shop window to put themselves out there. Mm-hmm. So I think there'll still be some sort of emphasis on performing well in Europe. Um, and obviously that has a, a monetary effect on Celtic as well. That that brings in money for the club. So the board will you would think would want them to do well in Europe as well as going for 10 in a row. So I'm not sure when it comes down to investment, as we spoke about on the last podcast, I think if Celtic can keep their wage bills similar to what they were at last year and bring in some some quality players like Forster and Nelly Inussi, then there's nothing stopping them having a good run in Europe and charging on towards the 10. But this is a situation that is completely unprecedented and we just don't know what's going on. There's only one team that seems to be spending money that they don't have at the minute, so... We'll be interested to see how that actually plays out. Nothing new there then, Colin, really. You're, you're talking about this being a season where the likes of Eduard may be looking for that next move. Such is the way with this type of player. And, and the thing with that as well is there is there's never a guarantee. I mean, Van Dyke done it, Dembele done it, Wanyama, but many, many others haven't. Many others have come to Celtic, their career stalled, they haven't progressed. So it is really down to the player and obviously Edward's the obvious one. But the player who is the subject of this moment in time, Olivier Encham, sometimes I view his Celtic career as a bit stop-start in and out of the side. You see him and he looks like the best player on the pitch. He looks like the classiest midfield player in Scottish football regularly. And then other times he just kind of fades away from the squad altogether for one reason or other. Do you think that uh, Encham still has his best football to play for Celtic? And if so, that may be in the coming season. You know, it's actually very interesting. I think Olivier Encham had one of his best games for Celtic that night in Rome. And I think he has a lot of his best performances when it comes down to either European matches or uh, matches against Rangers. Mm -hmm. Um, he, He seems to be absolute a Rolls Royce midfielder, totally dominant, strolls about the park as if he's got slippers on and he can control games when he wants to. And I think, to be fair to him, he's he's 24 years old. He's only really played 150 games across his career. Um, for a 24-year-old, that's actually not a lot. So for him, he's maybe still developing and maturing as a player. And I say, I think there was definitely better days to come for him, Cham. When we look at when he was potentially about to go down to West Ham back in January mm-hmm. and the bid was t- a talk of about £15 million pound or something like that. I can't remember specifics. But then he goes and plays against St Johnston that night and has an absolute fantastic game, scores the opening goal. That header was an absolute bullet. And after the game, he came out and said, I'm here, I'm Celtic, that's me. And I think there is a, a, a dedication to the club that he plays for. And I'm not sure how long he's got left in his contract, but... I think there's still there's still a lot to come from from Incham. His contract's actually up in 2022, so we've still got two years of Incham left. And I think if he's a very good year this year, then it could be another one that, that moves on after the 10. Well, here's hoping that we can keep some of our star men beyond 10 in a row. Colin, I think the last words on this moment in time will be reserved for Stan Collymore, who on that night tweeted... A black Muslim scored the winner for Celtic, witnessed by the fascist ultras of Lazio. Sometimes God really does shine his light in some fantastic ways. I think that's the best way to leave it at that then, Colony. All that's left for me to say is thank you for joining me on A Celtic State of Mind. I look forward to the next episode. A 
Celtic State of Mind has been named as one of seven finalists in the Best International Podcast category at this year's Football Content Awards. We won the Best Football Podcast Award in 2018 and it is a real achievement to be finalists once again. Thank you all for your ongoing support over the last three years. If you have been enjoying our daily content, then feel free to vote for a Celtic State of Mind at footballcontentawards.com. I have added the link to the bio of this episode and the instructions and further links are also on axom.net. You can also vote on Twitter by simply tweeting I am voting for at axompod in at the underscore FCAs for hashtag best podcast. Thank you again for all your support.